All right. Welcome, everybody, to Your Healthy Self. And today we've got an amazing show for you. And I'm, I'm going to be introducing our guests in, in just a moment. But before we jump in, I want to see how everyone is doing on their hacks. Our Health Accelerator Challenge last night was getting yourself to the place where you're eating really good sources of healthy fats. And last night was really cool because we had some of you uh, share your wins through this 100 day fat burning challenge that we've been on. We're on week 12 already, which is crazy. And we had people who have lost 20 pounds, 15 pounds, you know, the we had the, the most was 40 pounds. We had someone drop their their fasting blood glucose by 80 points. So just some overall really cool wins. So congratulations on that. Uh, if you're not a part of our hack community, uh, reach out to us and we'll get you on that, that community, in that community. So, so the other thing that I'm going to share with you is uh, we've got our pain summit uh, that goes live again today. So this is our, our first uh, uh, inaugural uh, knee and back pain summit. And we've got some of the world's greatest researchers and uh, doctors, physicians. We've got, uh, we talk about pain intervention. We talk about uh, how to sit when you're driving your car. I mean, we, we cover the whole gamut in this, this pain series. So make sure you get on that. This is, this is our encore weekend. We had hundreds of you sign up and watch it and love it. And so we are re-releasing it. So get on that. We've got links in the show note. And without further ado, let's jump into today's show because I'm super excited. We've got one of the funniest dudes in the world who also can spread some truth in the financial world and well-being. I look at health and wealth as being, you know, there's this this old phrase called well-being, which is kind of the merging of health and wealth. And uh, I would think we'd all agree that when we have our finances in order, it's much easier to get our health in order. And so I've asked my good friend, Garrett Gunderson, who's the chief architect of Wealth Factory, talented comedian to come on and, and shed some light on mistakes people are making when it comes to finances. And then just to talk about what he's doing in breaking down the barriers when it comes to your financial health. So we're going to talk about uh, how he teaches wealth management in his brilliant, funny, unique ways. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, maybe he'll share a few of his, his jokes with us. He's the best-selling author of Killing Sacred Cows overcoming the financial myths that are destroying your prosperity. And he's personally helped countless business owners create efficient wealth strategies to fit their unique strengths. So Garrett, good to have you on. What's up, man? Hey. hey uh, you know, like the first time I met you and your wife, I was impressed with her ink. I uh, just got this done, bro. Oh, look at you. Yeah. Garrett, whoa, that's colorful too. So I yeah, that was a, it was a long sit, just got it done. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I'm a comedian and now I've got some ink on me so different <laughs> than when you met me uh, but the good news is remember when you came into my basement for I set this up as like a comedy club to rehearse and practice and oh yeah you're a great audience member man you got the good laugh well you've uh, always cracked me up and, and I love your family jokes I love your jokes about uh, finances I mean you just you're you've got a good way of of spreading uh really good truths in between the, uh, the, the, the comedy. So I love that. Dude, one, I spoke at one of your events and I made a lady fall out of her chair. I wasn't <laughs> supposed to be doing comedy, but like your events always, I like was like 50% teaching, 50% making people laugh before I had announced that I was doing comedy. But you and I were actually in St. Cloud, Minneapolis once and I got up and uh, it was someone's event. I'm like, St. Cloud, it's like where someone just shit a bunch of chain stores and said, welcome. I'm like, the nicest restaurant here was a different, it, I could choose between Five Guys or Buffalo Wild Wings. So, uh, you know, I decided maybe I should be more selective where I go to speak after that. Sorry for those of you from St. Cloud. Yeah, I think you lost a few on that one there. They're like, wait, hey, don't talk about St. Cloud that way. <laughs> so so what, what's new in your life? Because... Uh, I mean, every time I talk to you, you've got this just new vision, new, new growth, but what's this next level? I mean, not, I mean, getting inked. So we could talk about that. That looks very interesting. Uh, my wife says, once you get one tattoo, you're just, you can't stop. So we'll, we'll see a sleeve in the next year or so. Um, <laughs> well, dude, I wrote this. Uh, so when COVID hit just before I had had this dream 
um, of how to really reach and impact people. And I called this guy, Michael Port, who's written a bunch of New York Times bestselling books because I'd been on uh, an A-lister event with him, which was 10 speakers. And it was the most painful 30 minutes of coaching I'd ever had. I'm just up on the stage. He's like, work on something you struggle with. And I did, and I just 30 minutes of him coaching me. So I knew he'd be the right guy for this dream. So I called him, I said, hey, I have a dream to get this, uh, write this play and take it to Broadway one day, but it'll be a new way to do a keynote. And he said, I'm in, I'm your director. So we started working on it. I'd fly out to Lambertsville. Uh, I don't know if that's Pennsylvania or New Jersey, it's right there on the border and spent entire days with them working on it. And then COVID hit. So I wasn't out there doing it. I'm just doing it for family and friends and practicing every single day. And I had had this uh, consultant named Barry Katz in the comedy world who saw me do a comedy set April of 2019. You were in the crowd. It was the one in the round. And he thought it was pretty funny. And he's like, what are you going to do with this? I'm like, well, I could integrate elements of comedy into my one man show that I've written. And what I realized is that wasn't really meant to be merged. And when COVID hit and the comedy clubs were still open, I said, all right, we're going to write a comedy special. And I went on his podcast called Industry Standard. And we start talking about it, but he doesn't introduce me till afterwards. And he, and we, in a quick conversation, I said, it'd be cool if I did this thing called the American Ream, which is the name of the comedy special on April 15th, which is the ultimate day of reaming. And uh, he announces it on his, on his thing. So this is like, November 15th, when I go out and record it, I write the outline for it. I've never done more than 33 minutes of comedy on stage before. And now I'm going to film a special. We got three Emmy winners, an Emmy nominated director to be on the crew and uh, film this on April 15th. And now I'm taking on a 15 city tour where I can help laugh people awake. So I, th I figure money sucks to learn about for most people. It's dry. It's boring. It takes courage to face. People don't want to hear about budgeting and cutting back and having a shittier life now so that one day, someday it could get better. And I'm like, well, maybe we can laugh and learn. Maybe I could bring some humor to this topic. And I talk about tax. And you know what's funny about tax, Reagan? What's that? Nothing. No, taxes <laughs> suck, dude. So I'm like, yeah, I'm make us laugh about that. I talk about inflation. I talk about uh, you know money myths and and uh, insurance, which is apparently we just pay for that so we could be interrupted with every TV program with another damn insurance commercial. So I go <laughs> off on that for a while. Uh, you know, talk about cryptocurrency. So all these topics that I think everybody wants to know about, they just don't want to learn about it because it's it's exhausting, it's painful, it's confusing, and I figure, hey, let's simplify it and enjoy ourselves along the way. Yeah, and you've done a great job at that. And, and uh, you know, I, I love in the American Ream, you sent me the video, I think it was the un, uncut version, but um, you, the audience is so uh, attuned to all the insurance commercials, you know, you're, you're like, like a good, like a good agent. And then everyone's yeah. like, State Farm is there. You know, I mean, it just was crazy. You went through like five or six of these major insurance companies and it, it made me pause for a moment to be like, wow, they are really marketing to us like crazy. Right. Hey, we give them money for something we hope to never use. And then they say, hey, we'll give this back to you if you have an issue. But they're so good at taking our money and giving it so little back that they afford commercials during the Super Bowl. So I'm like, why don't we just call this out? I'm like, hey, you really want to do right by me? Just charge less and pay your claims. My wife got a car accident in December. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, we happen to have an insurance company that doesn't advertise and they're, they're pretty high end. And when we called the, uh, the, you know, mechanic or collision place or whatever it is, they're like, okay, uh, we see there's about $8,000 of damage. Uh, they're going to try to get it down to $2,000. They pay for it. And you go, oh, wait, no, you're with these guys. Okay. They'll probably just cover it. And the, the companies that they're talking about are the companies that advertise. And this is what I'm talking about. The ream. I want people to learn, but more importantly, like, I love doing comedy. My grandma just turned 90 and we had a big party up at the park for, and all she wanted me to do was tell jokes, which are the jokes that would get me canceled and they're most inappropriate. And by the way, I, I live in Utah. I'm not Mormon, but my grandma is. And so she thinks these jokes are so funny and they're so inappropriate. I'm like, what a dirty mind she has. <laughs> like what's really going on when she's sitting in church in that mind of hers? Like, we don't want to know. Like I remember, Last time I went to visit her before, my hair's long. I have it pulled back this morning. But, you know, she's like, what is, are you think you're Jesus? So I wrote a bunch of Jesus jokes just in my grandma's honor since she was yelling at me for having long hair and being a hippie. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's where the whole thing started. But 
yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to do, do some jokes and things around, around money and finance, but I, I'm excited to just take this on the road and help people out and have a whole hell of a lot of fun. Well, I think it's so important because um, money has always been a serious conversation in my family. And that's, you know, my dad, he was a cattle rancher. who He always wanted to be a cattle rancher, but he was a banker to make, the, make ends meet. And it was always like, we can't afford this. Money doesn't grow on trees. And it was always a very serious conversation and it made money feel kind of like we can't make a decision unless we consult with money first. And so um, I love the way that you break it down because you just you put some humor around it so people can see it in a new light where we don't have to be dictated by it financially. And so so, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear, hear some of your jokes. Yeah. And by the way, we just celebrated my grandmother's 90th birthday. And um, I should have had you there sharing your jokes with her. <laughs> yeah, that's all my grandma the whole time. She's like, when are you going to do your jokes? When are you going to do your jokes? So I, I did 20 <laughs> minutes of jokes. Uh, it's, it's hilarious because, uh, you know, your dad said money doesn't grow on trees. Well, dude, it's, a co- it's out of cotton, isn't it? And is cotton a tree? So now that's back when he said it, it was true that it did grow on trees. Now he's right. It just grows on computer screens, right? They just, they just, they just add it to a screen like... If they're saying, oh, we just added $3 trillion to the economy, there's no printing presses putting out $3 trillion. Right. So for every dollar that's out there, there's like $600 on computer screens. Is that, that what the ratios are? Digital. Yeah, because we have derivatives and all these kind of, you know, very convoluted, complicated type of factors and, you know, notes that represent money. And now you've got digital currency that if everybody redeemed that. Uh, so it's, it's pretty, pretty wild and crazy that way. Yeah, I love your uh, your rap. You sound like Eminem when you start your American Reel. When you're like, yeah, yeah, you're going through that whole how many different currencies there are and what money really is. And let's see, I- I'll give them a flavor of the rap if I can. Let's see how well I remember it. Money, money talks, money walks. Money isn't everything, but money makes the world go around. Money can't buy you love, but money matters because time is money. Money doesn't grow on trees but it takes money to make money. There's easy money, even money, smart money, dumb money, old money, new money, mad money, funny money. There's loud money, hush money, short money, long money. You're beyond the money, in the money, even made of money because money makes the man. You can roll in the money, rake in the money, run for the money or take the money and run. You throw money at it, throw money around, even throw good money after bad. Money's no object when your money machine with money to burn, just pouring money down the drain. But for the love of money, hope your money grubbing hands get their money's worth. Oh, more money, more problems. Got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Get your money for nothing and your chicks for free. So show me the money. There's Balboas, Euros and Franks. Kip, what is it? Kips, Crones and Kronas. Liras, pesos, and pounds, reals, rubles, and rupees, drams, dinars, and dollars. Ah, the almighty dollar, top dollar, dollar for dollar. You can bet your bottom dollar, but you'll be a day late and a dollar short, or as phony as a $3 bill, y'all. So roll out your dough and turn those dollars to donuts. Hmm, delicious. Say, if you're money hungry, then maybe put your money where your mouth is. Maybe your bread and butter is to bring home the bacon to cook the books. The biscuits and broccoli, the cabbage and clams, the cake and the cream, the fins and frog skins, the chicken feed and chicken scratch, or the chips, cheese, cheddar, and gouda, or some salad and lettuce, or peanuts, and a nice nest egg. Hmm. Mm-mm-mm. Delicious. So anyway, that's a, that's like a third of it. Yeah, uh, that was awesome. More of it, but yeah. That was great. Well, so take us back to how you got into money in the first place, because I mean, you've helped thousands of people, but your story is really quite interesting because you grew up in a small, small little town in central Utah. Yeah, the heart of Utah, man. Price, Utah. Uh, Utah. My dad was a coal miner, my grandfather's and my great grandfather. I started a business when I was 15. Garrett Gunderson's car care, just detailing cars and saving every last dollar, pinching every last penny of, you know, what was being earned and uh, setting it aside and then I won $500 for being the rural young entrepreneur of the year. Then the next year I won it for the state, came with 5,000 bucks. I thought that was a ton of money. thought, hey, I should invest this. But I was under 18, so I needed a custodian. And my family, they put cash in coffee cans. They put those coffee cans in the cellar. I mean, they didn't go out to sporting events or they didn't you know, go to restaurants or concerts. Sounds a lot like COVID, right? <laughs> so so <laughs> I... 
yeah, quarantine. So I was like, oh, I, I really want to invest this money. So I didn't do that till I was 18. And when I was 18, I put it in a mutual fund based life insurance contract that they showed me earning 18% a year, which is illegal to demonstrate because it's not actually possible. And someone pointed that out to me. I started doing a lot of research and study. And by the time I was 19, I did an internship with a financial firm, which means I brought my friends and family to be peddled life insurance and, and investments and uh, sounded prestigious, wasn't that prestigious, but I was labeled as a fanatic because I was a kid always asking questions. I was a kid always challenging things because I wanted to learn it for myself. My original thought was I want to be wealthy because of how I invest my money, not because I give investment advice. And yeah. so that led me down owning over a hundred real estate properties at one time, buying oil and gas investments at one time and two IPOs at another time and having a hard money lending fund that financed real estate deals and just getting so involved and immersed in the financial world and being utterly bored um, with that aspect and not really passionate and selling life insurance. And then in 2005, I realized that mindset was key, that a lot of people just didn't understand that the money map and to understand what it was like to become economically independent where they had enough cash flow to cover their expenses and they can choose what they did on a daily basis. And so many people are stuck in this world of sacrifice. If I just do this now, one day I can live a better life. And if I just give up 30 years of my life, one day I could retire. But I found retirees weren't happier. I found the more money people made, the more money they wanted to make. And no matter how much they made, they couldn't fill this void of unrest where they just never felt like enough and they never felt lovable. And so I really did this deep dive, which began with me recognizing what an asshole I was in my early 20s and realizing that I was just in the hustle and the grind and threw my family under the bus to go to work and, and travel. My wife went to everything by herself and thank God she was patient and worked with me to become a better version of myself. I'm like, I'm like that uh, evolution chart, like the monkey dragging his knuckles. And then now I'm almost a big boy that can stand on his own. Uh, but in, in that intellectual honesty and in being inquisitive and in doing a lot of deep work, I started to realize what money really was. And then it became this like shield where people couldn't see people on the other side. It became this blinder where people couldn't learn how to create value consistent with who they were. They were. It became this thing that people chased at the expense of their life and at the expense of their joy. And it's not something to be vilified. There's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with it when it's in its proper place. It's an efficient tool of exchange. But ultimately, I realized that entertainment was the gateway to get people into a new conversation. Nobody really wants to be educated and feel like they're doing something wrong when they're working their ass off to get there. What right. they would rather do is laugh and be like, oh, that was a good point. Yeah, who wants to wait till they're 85 to finally enjoy life? You know, the only thing that happens when you're 85 is you wake up and some days you wish that wouldn't happen. Everything hurts, you can't open your eyes, they're all swollen. Now you gotta go be president. <laughs> so, so i'm like you think i want to wait until i'm 85 to go jet skiing reagan i'll probably break a hip you know so so i want people to learn how to enjoy life along the way and how to master the money game without without having to just scrimp and save and budget their life away or hustle and grind their life away those are usually the two structures that people get stuck in and i'm here to show them how to enjoy life now and really understand how money becomes something that's useful to them not something that they give up their life for so what are those, I mean, Killing Sacred Cows is a phenomenal read and you've written several books and just really, uh, sh I mean, you, you've shined more light on, on my financial intelligence, I guess we'll call it, than anyone else ever has. And I just want to thank you for that. Um, I feel more, more stable, uh, more capable, just, uh, just better equipped than I ever have. And so, um, but what are those ma major myths? Like what are the sacred cows we need to get rid of? First off, it just feels good that you called my book Killing Sacred Cows. The very first time that book gets released and I go on like a radio show, uh -huh. that guy's like, oh, the author of the book Killing Scared Crows. And I'm like, <laughs> scared, like what am I, a terrified bird murder enthusiast? Like, what is that? And so I kept saying Killing Sacred Cows and he kept saying Killing Scared Crows. And then at the end, he's like, Hey, uh, Garrett, what do you think I should invest in? I was like, oh, I, I know exactly what you should invest in. Bifocals, literacy, <laughs> a new career, right? <laughs> Here's but, a start. <laughs> yeah, like that would be good. But yeah, this book's, that book's really like holds the, the test of time. I just recorded Disrupting Sacred Cows coming out later this year, which right. is kind of the follow-up. And I go into some more depth. Uh, 
but the reality is there's these like nine financial myths that people buy into and they're not obvious lies. The obvious things we know how to avoid. They're very subtle and they're reinforced with a lot of marketing and manipulation and with Wall Street. Like, and it's crazy that people trust Wall Street. I mean, I feel like trusting Wall Street is like asking an arsonist to run the fire department. <laughs> it's like, Reagan, it's like asking a stripper if you're handsome. <laughs> well, you are while you're paying me. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's in your wallet? Not even self-esteem when Cheyenne gets done with you. <laughs> Turns out she's not shy at all, Reagan. Not one bit. Not one bit. So, so yeah, this is, you know, this is helping shed light on, on things most people don't know about. So they know how to avoid the missteps and mistakes, which means they'll keep more of what they make. They take less risk. And ultimately, they, I think that book's the best at giving people permission to succeed. That a lot of times we don't have permission for it that when people gain wealth they feel guilt or when people start having some success they feel you know things like that so got it well and that's that that's interesting you know breaking through the the barriers that people have is so important what do you see as far as an impact on health i mean you've worked with uh so many clients but do you see that there's a correlation with people's health maybe their blood pressure <laughs> diabetes tendencies when it comes to financial stress it's chronic stress financial stress is chronic stress that people just start going this is how i have to live my life and ultimately everything deteriorates so if we just think about money's listed as the number one reason for divorce money problems um but the reality is when we have money issues we stop dreaming we stop having hope for the future and we stop thinking about what we want and get into a place where we just know what we don't want. We want to get rid of this. We want to get eliminate this. And that type of thinking gets us in scarcity. And scarcity is the greatest destroyer of wealth ever. And so what I think scarcity around money creates is disconnection and yeah. disease. Because I know, like, there's all sorts of stuff you can read that people hold anger in their kidneys and it starts to create issues there. Or, like, I mean... Like, I just, I just know what stress does to health. You know, even deeper with, oh, yeah. you know, your credentials, but more than anything, what you see firsthand with people every single day. I mean, I'm in your office every week getting acupuncture just to relax, you know? And they always ask, how's your level of stress? And I'm like, most of the time, it's pretty good. But every day I'm like, you know, I've taken on a few too many things right now with this comedy tour. So it's a little higher than normal. Glad I'm here today. Because I recognize how much that stress impacts, right? from hypertension. And the thing about stress is it's not like a baseball bat to the face. It's kind of like a, a, a backpack that's weighted that you just start going, well, this is just how it is to walk. And you're like, right. oh, there's 40 extra pounds you're carrying around of stress that if it was lifted, your energy would elevate, your right. sleep would get better, your thoughts would be more abundant. Like, so it has such a detrimental long-term effect, but the reason we don't talk about it enough is because short-term, we find ways to cope with it but coping leads to like underlying issues and that chronic illness just starts to become the new normal. And that's a term that I never enjoyed. And I know they try to use that during COVID, the new normal, but the new normal is, oh, we just live with stress. Like our ancestors live with stress in that like, oh, this animal might eat me and I need to get some food, but they sat with no worries for long periods of time and then had high moments of stress. We just sit in this cloud of stress in society today because people don't understand money. And when we don't understand it, it's intimidating. When it's intimidating, it's a bully that lives in our life day by day. And we just start finding ways to deal with the bully, but that is at the expense of who we are. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting concept that it, it, it is a bully. And, and just by looking at everything that the hormone cortisol can do when it gets dysregulated, that's your stress hormone. I mean, it starts deteriorating your muscle, you can't thrive, your body goes into a, a catatonic state. So um, you're not thriving, you're not growing. So I think it's a really important thing for people to tackle. So, um, and by the way, I, I, I have this firsthand experience with my health. So I've been around an amazing doctors and amazing authors just in the nature of Wealth Factory being like half of our clients are in the space. You know, you referred so many docs to us as well that I got an overwhelming amount of information. I think this happens to people financially too. So yeah. I got to the point where I was like, I'm stressed eating a salad because I'm not sure if it's organic. Right. Wait, is there vegetable oil in my oil? Because that's going to destroy me. Wait, this has too much sugar. And so 
every bite of food I had, I had stress around. And that stress releases that cortisol. So even if it was healthy food, my level of restriction and judgment around everything became chronic. And so in October last year, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna like relax a little bit about this stuff. And what's interesting is I started dropping weight, eating a little less clean. Now, I, yeah. I started walking more. I was kind of in the old CrossFit mentality of like, I have to hit a crazy hour workout or else it doesn't count. I went for an hour and a half walk today and did a 10 minute pump session, you know, and it felt, it felt really good. So I started to look at like more stress-free living and more like, Hey, what did our ancestors do a little bit more? And, and, you know, into a little bit of that. And I think the same thing happens with money. Part of the reason we check out with it is it's overwhelming. And I'm part of that problem in the past. You know me, I talk fast. I give so much information. And one of the gifts comedy brought me is pause mm -hmm. and, and just bringing it in a way that anyone could understand it. I could walk through insurance and everybody goes, yeah, that's funny. And that, yeah, that's totally how that is. Or I could walk through taxes and you're like, yeah, why would I want to tip the government? Tipping, you know, tipping is a great way to say thank you. Job well done. Not something I associate with the government, Reagan, you know, <laughs> because they're the government, you know. So if you, most people don't know how to properly save on tax, which is like tipping the government, which is like tipping a waiter, 39 point, who ate 39.6% of your meal and peed in your soup. Why would you do that? You wouldn't. So I, I, I'm having a lot of fun with it. And it's, you know, I, I'm obsessed with it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that it does a lot of uh, uh, good. My sound engineer was like, dude, you had so many gut punches where I'm like, that's a good point about money. Like they didn't expect to learn. And he even said, he goes, I was pretty highly skeptical. And they're like, oh, there's a comedian going to do something on finance. I'm like, why? We've, they've done everything on religion and politics, which you're not supposed to talk about. So why not money? You know, we're not supposed to talk about that either. They just didn't have someone that knew enough about it. Co comedians aren't good money managers, typically. Yeah, well, and, and money tends to be the biggest taboo. I mean, you, you could probably get people to talk more freely about their sex life than their financial life. Right. And I just decided to do both in the special. My, the, the joke that my wife wanted uh, cut out, there were two. Um, like one day we're just here in my, in my house and I've got a couple of my guys, you know, Aaron and David over and I'm doing a Zoom comedy practice. And I was writing, I'm like, it's not just the dumb stuff that we do for money. It's the dumb stuff we do with money. And I go, I've done dumb stuff with money. And my first jokes were, I just wrote them that day. I'm like, Jabo jeans. Yeah, I bought Jabos. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that's how you say them. How about guess overalls? I never knew. Was it one strap or two? Shirt on or shirt off? How did you wear it? Did you, did, you look like you had guess overalls sometime, Reagan. I may have, but I don't think I had the money to buy them. So it just okay. wasn't it. Yeah. But maybe, I, maybe you I, had, I, maybe you had the, uh, the other version called I have the Rain Park. I have the Wrangler version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. mine is yeah. just a question mark. Yeah. <laughs> so, or like a college degree. My kids learn more for, for free from YouTube. I mean, they're stuck in conspiracy, but they're not riddled with student loan debts. So <laughs> suck on that, Harvard. And right. then this is the joke that she really hated the most. I go, or extends. Then everybody <laughs> got quiet. I'm like, okay, guys, pretend like you don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, extends. I took the once daily pill for growth. <laughs> I'm like, just checking every night if it worked, being like, hey, babe. Come over here. Is it, is it bigger? <laughs> no, it's not cold in here. Why? <laughs> and of course it didn't work. Otherwise, dudes would have drowned whole bottles of this. They'd have to go carry around their dong in a wheelbarrow. You know, <laughs> women would be like, what am I supposed to do with that? Putting it in a onesie? That's not going anywhere near me. You get a claim as a dependent on your tax returns. So <laughs> she, sees, she sees me. She goes, you can't do that joke. I'm like, why? She's like, because people are going to think you're not big, you know? I'm like, babe, you're the <laughs> only one that sees it. And you know what? Like, who cares? They, they already know. You don't get this kind of sense of humor in a 12 incher. Those guys do a different type of stand up, you know? <laughs> so, so I'm writing all this and she's just like, no, you can't share that. I'm like, and it, unfortunately, she, it was a true story in my early 20s. Like, those are the types of businesses you just need to have a customer one time, be dumb enough to take it and then be like, oh, it, it didn't work. No shit, it didn't work. And then I, my, my segue is just like these pills didn't make you bigger. There's no magic financial product to make you richer. And then I take them into some more financial stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's genius. Well, I also, I, I enjoy your jokes about your kids. Always funny when you have a favorite kid. <laughs> but, 
my wife says the other day, my, you know, we got two kids and, and my son goes, do you regret having kids? She goes, well, just one of them. <laughs> and he goes, wait, who was it? She goes, that's what makes that funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah. It's, I like how you have your son introduce you to at, at the, uh, at the show. I mean, I think that's, that adds a real special. He, he did five minutes of comedy and open for me on the first show and did really good. Man. Really good. Brought so the energy up. What's the tour looking like? I mean, when does it launch? And I know we got a lot of listeners that's from September the 7th. It starts yeah. and it goes all the way through just before Thanksgiving. We're hitting major cities like San Diego, LA, Phoenix, Vegas, the metropolis of Salt Lake City, where Ooh. I'm sitting right now. Uh, we're doing Austin and Dallas and Chicago and St. Louis and Miami and New York and, and uh, Philly and D.C. So, you know, should be it should be pretty near to someone and tickets are 47 bucks, but I'm giving them my audio book that I did. Uh, Diane just said, Denver, we have uh, someone that wants me to come to Boulder that hosts concerts. So we haven't confirmed that yet. Oh, I also am doing New Orleans, but New Orleans is already sold out because someone else promoted it. Um, so, and I'm part of a festival thing there. Um, but these other ones, 47 bucks, they get an audio book of win and play. Cause you're like, how in the hell did this guy become a comedian overnight? Or how did I write a New York times bestseller book? Well, I have this formula that anyone can use. And so I put it in a book, uh, called win then play, which is how you escape these traps we're talking about. And then we're going to give them, uh, I'm bringing a film crew on this so that there's something in comedy called happy accidents. Like I say something mess up and all of a sudden I go off on this tangent that's funnier than the other stuff. So we're gonna capture all those, send those to people because they'll, we'll be doing so many different dates. And then we're also gonna give them a little financial strengths finder where they can go through and figure out where their weaknesses and strengths are, their finances, and we're kind of bonus that. So again, laugh and learn. And uh, you, you saw the, the you saw before it was ready and laughed pretty hard. And then I sent you the link of the actual special that we're, we're pit and, and that we're really looking for support because we want to get this on a streaming service. And in order to do that, I've got to fill these comedy dates so that when the streaming services call and go, hey, like, um, who's this guy? They go, oh, we had a full house last night. People loved it. You know, like the, that night, I got to tell you, I think that link I sent you, I'm, I didn't even know I could be that good, man. But I just have such a good team around me. It's, you know, it, it hey. turned out great. Is that ready to go? I mean, is that something we can That's, share? You can't share it yet just because we're, we're pitching it to the streaming services. Got it. Um, but, but also when people just like opt in to the email sequence, they'll yep. get 10 minute that night you were there in the round that are all my family jokes that you like so much. <laughs> they, they get that as a bonus. So they're going to get that and a different audiobook, the first version of the audiobook. So we're, we're, giving, we're showering people with gifts to bribe them to support this whole thing. But we just know that it's going to require a bunch of people coming in and being part of it. And people I always feel like support, which they help to build. And so many people are so key in this comedy career. It's insane from just encouraging me to telling me I was funny to listening to my jokes to like you coming to my house while I practice coming to the to the set there in the round and leaving me and going to Albuquerque the night I filmed it. But that's OK, because we're, we're coming right back to your backyard. I'm actually doing I'm actually I have three comedy sets. I have one tomorrow night. I'm here in Salt Lake, so I could keep pushing you and making you come out and, and watch me again and again. Man, I'm in Vegas tomorrow night, but that's uh, all right, dude. I, you're gonna you're gonna hit one of these dates. I'll make you fly to Manhattan or something. <laughs> Maybe that will have to happen. Yeah, you're doing an awesome job. So, what are like if we just looked at some of the things you'd love to teach people about finances in the comedy? What what are what are like two or three major things that you'd love for every human to know about when it comes to money? The money myths are the first thing that I'm really helping people out with. And yeah. like, and it's just so succinct. Like the, the jokes are so short and clear, mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, and, and some of them are kind of harsh. Like, I'm like, some people say money's not important, which means they probably don't have much of it because who, who needs a bunch of unimportant stuff lying around? Like, that's a big lesson, yeah. you know, or like, wow. like I have another one where I'm like, people just get mad when money doesn't do what it was never intended to do. Hey, money make me happy. And so then I have a whole comedy set around that. Or I have a whole thing talking about like, isn't it crazy how much we deal with money, but there's no instruction manual with it? Is there anything else in our life so consequential that we get no instruction with? Like right. if you want to drive a car, you got to go take a test and get a license. Yeah. You know? If 
you want to carry a gun, you got to go take a test and get a license. If you want to rob people, you got to become a bank and get a license. <laughs> you know, like I just have, but, it, but people start thinking about this and I start going through it so they can question some of these notions. Um, uh, and so, yeah, other like the money myths is one of my favorite sections, but the insurance section's insane how much people get from that. And then I, the thing that turned out best in the special was the inflation section because I, I accidentally messed up and it ended up being way funnier. Um, I don't know if you remember the Paris story. Um, oh, yeah, I remember the Paris story. That's that wasn't I planned. The whole tooth bunny thing was an accident. It, it stayed in there. Like those were the funniest bits. Making fun of my wife when she said she was going on spring break when we were dating and didn't need money. I'm like, why don't you need money? She goes, oh, the guys will like take care of you. They're just super nice. I'm like, oh, for like, I'm like, really? They're super nice. Like, you know, I'm like, that sounds like a government program. And then I go through that. And I think that the big thing though, is I have people really question the notion of retirement because a lot of people miss out on experiences in life. I'm like, why? So you can get 30 years of days off when you're too old to finally enjoy the things that you worked for and miss out on the opportunities and the memories and to do that in a less hurtful, but more funny way, I think was, was important. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because people do, I think retirement is one of those, um, those, it, it's sort of like a carrot on a stick. It's like this, this mystery that we all you're, you know, work towards retirement, save for retirement. And then when you get to the end, I have people who come in and they're like, all right, I've worked my entire life and I'm ready to enjoy it, but I'm so sick. Uh, I'm in so much pain. I can't even sleep at night. And they're, they're hoping to write a check and just get their health back and, and recovered. But I imagine if people took some mini retirements throughout the course of their career, it would actually really help. And, and a four hour work week by Tim Ferriss, I think he had some pretty interesting uh, insights on uh, taking these little, little breaks in your career. Uh, so, so what, why do people wait until they're retired to actually take trips and enjoy life? Is it, they, they want, they have an idea in their head about the amount of money they need saved before they can actually start investing in them, in themselves or what, what do you, what do you find happens? So look, there's four different money personalities and you have to understand two of the money personalities try to scrimp, save budget, defer and delay. Those money personalities are the miser playing the game called preservation. In the game of preservation, it's about what can they do to cut out expenses and reduce and eliminate and coupon clip. And they'll spend a lot of their time doing what they can to save money, but they're also kind of scared of where to put their money. So they don't get much growth from it either. The second one that plays not to lose and still in that mindset is the conservative who plays a game called accumulation. They're more willing to fund retirement plans and they're not going to coupon clip their life away because they value their time a little bit more but they're also thinking they're not willing to take risk, but they take a lot of risk because almost all of their, their fuel is in the stock market. They, they do mutual funds and index funds and, and they wait because they think that if they delay long enough, they have that notion the best things come to those who wait or they're in it for the long haul. And that's just some of those myths that really appeal to that personality. So those play not to lose people will stick to budgeting. One will kind of put cash in coffee cans or in a savings account or a CD, the other one will put it in a retirement plan. That's all about one day, someday, and any dollar they spend now, they realize has an impact in the future. So when I played that game, when I was like the conservative and my wife would try to order a glass of wine at dinner, I'd be like, babe, do you know that $6 would turn into $228 and four cents over the next 40 years if we invest it in this mutual fund? And so I was that guy that was a lecturing dick all the time trying to reduce money. You know, and then on the other side, there's these two types of money personas that play to win. One is called the striver. The mm. striver plays a game called status, and they're willing to work harder and sacrifice in order to have more. But they are workaholics primarily. Mm. They're, when you're around them, they can really burn you out and they can be exhausting. So they like nice stuff and do nice things, but they still want to reinvest every dollar and grow because that's the key. The other one is the high roller. The high roller plays a game called opportunity. So they want to invest not only their money, but other people's money. So they can have an extraordinarily extravagant lifestyle and be super important. And, and those four kind of shadow personas are, are where people get trapped. They're all losing games. But all of those personas have a counterpart 
if you live in the world of co-creation and collaboration, if you live in the world of service and value creation, if you're designing a game worth playing and you set up a game to win from the beginning, then instead of being a miser, you can be a mindful manager. Mm. Mindful manager is detail oriented. They're detail oriented. They're efficient. They're great at improving things. They're instrumental for any organization that looks to be more resourceful, enhance ideas and reduce waste. And then when we look at the conservative, their counterpart that again, plays in co-creation and collaboration and value for others and has a vision and in supporting and not just looking at what they can do for themselves in a selfish way. Well, they're stable, thoughtful, strategic people. They're instrumental for organizations looking to, you know, monitor the effectiveness and efficiency of an initiative or plan for contingencies or reduce risk. The strivers counterpart becomes the creator the creator is uh, someone that leads with innovation and ingenuity, and they inspire others. The high roller becomes a catalyst. You've been a catalyst for me, sending so many referrals. The catalysts think and play big. They're the visionaries. They're the connectors and movers and shakers, and they show us ways we can all win together. So the key is, which persona are you living? Your winning persona in a winning game, or are you in a shadow losing persona, trying to scrimp and save or hustle? And most people don't know a different way because they think you have to do things yourself, or they think that if you want something done right, you can only rely on yourself, or that there's a finite game and you, it's a zero sum game where you got to take all that you can, which Killing Sacred Cows was really masterful at helping people see that there's a different way. This dives in even more. And those four personas are what these audio books I'm giving away as part of the, uh, you know, when they come to the show or when they just register and get some of the bonuses, it's part of what we're giving. And what's unique about this tour is I've got two day workshops off six of the cities. So people can come to comedy one night, then the two day workshop, which the, see, the thing I've been spending the most time and energy in is this thing that's called Already One, which is a play that actually helps people learn about which persona they are, how to escape the shadow one and embrace the winning one and design that game worth winning. And we actually take them through a two day workshop so they can get their financial house in order, have a much better situation. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm up to, which again is kind of unique for what we're doing here compared to what most people would be doing with comedy. Yeah. And, and most people in the financial world, because most of the time you, you hire a financial planner and they're going to get you in a 401k. They're going to park your money somewhere. And, and then you've got a bunch of, uh, fees you're paying. And, and, you know, the other concept that you, you talk about is, um, this fact that, uh, taxes are continually on the rise. And so if we keep delaying taxes, uh, like in a 401k, for example, you know, what, what are the risks of that? Because that was pretty enlightening for me. Well, let's, let's think about it. Um, right now, the president of the United States is saying he wants to increase taxes, and not just a little, a lot. And when you're adding trillions of dollars to the economy, that's already a tax because it inflates you know, prices, which is a way to tax our money without having to write a check. It just means our money doesn't go as far. Yeah. But there's also, hey, when they have all these programs like Social Security, that's essentially bankrupt because every dollar that goes in it gets borrowed and, and, and there isn't any money in there. And now all of a sudden they've got to pay for that. And all of a sudden they're just mailing out checks to people. How are they going to pay for all these things? You know, from 1944 to 1981, the tax bracket was above 50%. Right now, it's you know 37 and a half on the top bracket. They're probably gonna or they're gonna move it to 39.6 if the uh, plan goes through. But even at 39.6, that doesn't sound like a huge increase, other than you have to make a third less money before you're at the top bracket. So they sneak wow. in there that they oh. start escalating the taxes at a faster rate in order to get more tax revenue. So what if they what if they raise taxes to 60% to pay for these major programs that they're trying to fund? And yeah. more importantly, what if just because of inflation, you have to have more money to buy the same things in the future, you better hope you have more money. This notion that financial planners tell you you need 70% of your pre retirement income to live on is garbage. Because what I found was when I took, you know, time off and wasn't working, I spent more money, because I had more time, like, I went to more concerts. I, I, you know, I went and did more things. It wasn't cheaper to live when I was taking two months off to live in Italy. It was more expensive because, you know, we're traveling around. So, you know, last and think, dude, you and I saw each other in Amsterdam just before the whole pandemic hit. Well, that was that we did that trip. Yeah, I'm like, I, I'm standing in line to get on the plane and I get a text from Reagan. 
He's like, are they going to move this line along or what? And I was like, here we are in the Amsterdam airport. No, I said, it. I, hey, Jesus, can you part the ways? You know, okay. <laughs> I looked above. I was like, there's Jesus. Because you guys don't see Garrett's full hair, but it's awesome. Mm -hmm. he, he does. You should be a Jesus model. If things don't go well in the uh, comedy, you could always go and get painted. Well, to be fair, I don't look like Jesus. I look like Utah Jesus. <laughs> That's true. I'm like the Abercrombie and Fitch Jesus, you know? <laughs> I'm like Jesus if he had a stylish barber or something like that. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, there's uh, that, that was pretty, uh, that, was, that was interesting seeing you all the way across the world. Amsterdam. Hey, yeah. it's Garrett. I, I took my parents and I took him to the red light district. So I'm like, this is just crazy. And my dad's like trying to take pictures because he and he's taking selfies instead of taking pictures of the red light <laughs> district. And so we like to tease him. My parents had truffles for the first time. They're in their, you know, late sixties and never had it. So that was a really cool experience. Like that's why I, I didn't, I don't wait for retirement. I take these trips along the way. Cause I, I think that what, what are people going to do when they retire, spend 90% of their time on social media instead of 70, like, you know, like, what do you do in retirement? Like if you find something that you enjoy enough, you wouldn't want to retire from it, but we've been told do what you hate so that you have enough money to do what you love, but then you don't have time to do what you love. And retirement's not good news. Retirement means to take out of service. That's something they do to an old cow behind the barn. That's what your dad used to do as a farmer, right? Oh, yeah. If they retire a player's jersey or a vending machine or an airplane, that's not good news. It means it's not useful anymore. So what does that say about us when we retire? Hey, Ma, what do we do with dad now? We're not using him anymore. I just throw him in that spare room by the treadmill until he dies. <laughs> you know? I mean, what, what is that? Yeah, well, and that's where Social Security came in is the, the life expectancy was 67. And they're like, all right, well, you can retire at 65 and stop working. And this was back in the industrial age. I don't, you probably know the numbers better than I did, but people are working 50, 60 hour weeks. Right. And then it's like, okay, you can not be a slave for two years of your life, and then you, we expect you to die. Well, yeah, retirement was invented in a different time, a time of brawn, right? Like assembly lines and railroads, hard yeah. labor. Kids today don't labor. <laughs> Driving people around in your Uber isn't labor. Watching this Zoom isn't labor. Typing on it isn't labor. That's not what we do. But I was a coal miner. He deserved Labor Day off to rest his broken mining skeleton and his black lung. You know, when I think about labor, I think of sanitation workers and I think about construction people or Al Roker's personal trainer, hard labor. I mean, you see him, he's looking great. That's some work there, right? I mean, ladies, that's why uh, they call having a baby labor because it's hard ass work that wrecks the body and you guys deserve a few hours off afterwards for recovery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just a few hours and then right back at it. How toned up is that, right? Only like a dude would be so stupid to say something like that. So. Yeah. Well, and now it's a different time. So uh, I think the, the most beautiful thing and, and where you've helped me the most and several of my uh, great friends uh, in the Go Wellness community is you've helped us see that, hey, maybe there's some creativity you can have in life and cash flow might be a more important thing than just having this, this big accumulation of, digital numbers uh, where you feel like you now have enough security uh, so that you can take a few weeks off when you're 65. I mean, it's it's a totally different mindset and a different way of looking at life. And actually, I believe it helps you appreciate life more when you take time to pause and change up your routine. Look, if you're an NFL player, retiring early makes sense. But when you're in the game of using your mind, you you're you have more to offer now than you did 10 years ago. And I don't think that's going to change when you're 65. I think you're going to have even more opportunity. So what if you create a vision you never want to retire from? Yeah. What if you think about the impact? Think of all the problems in the world. I think we have the people to solve them. But unfortunately, most of the people are so busy retiring. And now, like, I'd just say, take some time off along the way. Enjoy life. Find things that you enjoy. Learn how to delegate. Like, find the thing that you want to keep doing. That's what I've found. I, I don't, you know, I love getting up on stage and telling jokes. I, I, I enjoy it. I love helping people dial in their finances. That's fun. Um, I guess I'm weird because of that second one, but hey, uh, thank God that someone's willing to do it. Right. Well, like you said, I mean, we don't receive a manual on that. And I, I feel the same about health is it's not like we go to school and 
your PE teacher just giving you incredible advice. You know, my weightlifting teacher was just like, lift as much as you can. And you know, I remember bench pressing 300 pounds and my body's all contorted. And yeah, just a, a lot of damage gets done along the way. And it's no different with finances when all they teach you in school is basically, here's how you balance a checkbook. Well, and no one uses a checkbook these days and that can be automatically done. So yeah, I, I, well, like, you have that whole bit on checkbooks in my thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you hit all the, all the nuances of it. And so, so, I mean, I'm super excited. I'm one of your biggest fans, as you know, and I love seeing your work. Garrett comes on stage at our Go Wellness events and just lights up the crowd, you know? They're, there's there's nothing better yeah i can't even remember who it was that fell out of her seat but there's been a lot of people who have just had tears in their face so you will not want to miss uh garrett when he comes back around to utah or denver or boulder if you end up in boulder new york so wherever you guys are make sure you hit up his show and then what's a what's a great way people can start engaging with you right away and start just, learning about yeah email aaron a-a-r-o-n at freeflow.group a-a-ron a-a-r-o-n at freeflow.group and you know we'll, we'll add you to the updates if, if that's what you want to do and just uh i, I want to communicate directly with people and and you know we'll be you know cautious about that how often we reach out and you can let us know but my feeling is we'll keep you updated because here's the little uh schedule we're working on and everything and the this side that's green means it's locked in and what's white or yellow means we're just almost there so we're we're super close to all these dates and which locations and, and uh, you know, email Aaron and he'll keep you updated and we'll get you some cool resources and we can send you a little video of me doing some comedy. Um, and uh, my comedy is pretty clean, strangely enough, a little sexual, sexual innuendo. I think I swear three times in the special. I say dick twice. I'd say bullshit once. I tried it as BS. It's just not as funny. So I had to do it. Um, but if you if you've got your kids around, I will spoil all things santa claus easter bunny and tooth fairy so make sure not to have them around if you want them to believe in those things <laughs> good 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 call um but yeah i i uh, i've had one of my sons listen to your work so uh they love it um so so this has been awesome really appreciate the work you're doing garrett um appreciate our collaboration uh, thanks for, for helping me with my health my little yeah. my stems you know stuff yeah. the, the acupuncture i'm doing all the time so I'm you know, happy to help and thanks for helping me get my finances uh, and especially my mindset around them uh, squared away. It was actually my wife who did all the work on it. So she, you told her what to do. I said, well, I'll do it eventually. And she just got the thing done. And so, uh, so I really appreciate the coaching you guys have given us. It's been awesome. So, and, and thanks for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun, man. Have a great one. Awesome. And thanks to everyone in our community here. Um, make sure you guys uh, check out the hacks for next week and we will be on same time, same place. Love you all. Bye-bye.